All right, about to transition us towards something that's going to be really, really special. I believe it's going to bless you today. It's going to encourage you. It's going to challenge you in your faith today. It's going to be something very unique. We've never done anything like this before. Uh, but, man, uh, I'll tell you why I wanted to do this here shortly. But I just want to tell you in just a second, I'm going to introduce a friend of mine, and he's going to come and share a really, really powerful story today. But, uh, man, I just felt led to say this real quick, uh, that if you have little ears that are listening with you today, all right, uh, whether that's here in the room or online, I just want you to know that um, part of the things that are going to be shared today, parts of uh, the story of my friend, uh, may be a little sensitive for some of them to hear, uh, not the whole thing, but some of it. And so um, just making you aware of that for you to make a decision on how you want to handle that, whether you want to take advantage of our Little Life and Kid Life Ministries or step out in our lobby today if you need to, or if you're online, just to be aware. But here's what I believe, man. I believe God wants to speak today all right, in a really powerful way through a really uh, powerful, gospel-centered, true life rescue story. And so I'm going to ask you to put your hands together and uh, help welcome my friend, Mr. Frank Pond. You know, I met, uh, good morning. How about that? Good morning. Good we, morning, we everybody. Start there. Yeah. Thank you for having me here today. It was a blessing and a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I, I'm going to let Frank tell him uh, tell a little bit about himself uh, here in just a minute. But, uh, man, I, I met Frank uh, man, a number of months ago now uh, through his restaurant here in our city. But a few weeks ago, a number of weeks ago, I got to hear Frank's story. And, uh, man, when I heard Frank's story, I immediately said, we got to share that with the family. Um, and so, man, today you're going to get a chance to hear a really powerful story uh, about God's love and God's redemption in Frank's life. But before we dive into your story, Frank, uh, why don't you tell us just a little bit about your family uh, that supports you and is, uh, and is gathered with you here in the States? Awesome. Well, um, my name is Frank Pond. I'm married this June 28. It'll be my 30-year anniversary. Thank you. All made possible. God gave her a lot of patience to keep up with me. <laughs> I have three uh, beautiful kids, amazing uh, twin boy, Christian and Jonathan. Jonathan is uh, a 10 Ole Miss. He finished his four years, and he still wants to continue. And Christian is uh, at MC. He graduated already, from, uh, and he is teaching at the Madison City School. And I got a, my life, beautiful daughter, 17, she's at Madison Central. And um, she's the first girl in the Pond family. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, I have a donut shop and um, breakfast place here in Pearl, in the Pearl uh, Kroger parking lot. Guys, please come by the day that you're hungry. You don't have to bring money. I want to make sure... You won't get out there starving like me right, in, in, back in the day. The same time, if you need to feed your soul for the day, to start your day, we have a prayer room in the back. I carved that, you know, it's just all he asked, 10% of us back. So we, I hope that room is big enough, 10% for <laughs> to, to worship. So we have a prayer room there uh, you need to, us to pray for, and we have a lot of guests that come in. Put a prayer request on there. Yeah, it's amazing how God answered their prayer. There's people come in and tell us, I need to take my prayers down because God have answered. That's amazing. So that's Uh, I'm a part of a men's life group, and we, we gather at Frank's Restaurant every Tuesday morning, and uh, so, man, got a chance to interact with him and hear a little bit about his story through that interaction, and I can vouch. I know today's not a commercial for your business, uh, but I can vouch, uh, man, God's doing a good work through them here as a part of our city, and that's another part of the reason I wanted to bring you in, man. We're, we're a church that wants to be for our city and definitely for the gospel and the light of Jesus spreading in our city, and so... Frank, why don't you tell us a little bit about, um, in your growing up years and the environment of uh, what you experienced as a young boy? Well, um, I'm Cambodian. I come from Cambodia. Um, to give you a little bit of where it is in South Asia, our country is a little bit smaller than Oklahoma State. And um, it's set between Thai and Vietnam, right in the middle there. Well, before 1975, the life, the people live there, it's no more like us here. You know, we wake up, go to work, get kids ready to go to school, 
uh, go on, do our work to support our family, gather whenever we want. It's just normal like us here. But suddenly in 75, the same year, the Khmer Rouge, which is the communist Khmer, uh, Cambodian, they took over our country. It take them less than 24 hours to take control the entire Cambodia. So what they do first, they come to the city first, just like us here at Pearl, we call it city. They come in, just walk in this room right here, just get out, get out, get out, get out. And then they shot at, if, if we stumble, if we don't get fast enough, they just shoot, shoot at us. Just see how many people in here right now. Probably 10 of us make out the door live right now. So it's a form of intimidation, and then when they go to house to houses, just shooting, they're just shooting. Get out, get out. They want us to get out to the rice field, the open field where they can control and see all of us. And, and within 24 hours, they they got fully control of the city. Now people out in the field, uh, rice field. So. Uh, that moment, they just separate us. They start separating us. Uh, boy go by boy, girl go by girl, man by man, woman by woman. And then um, if you are five years old and older, doesn't matter boy or girl, they take you away from your parents if your parents are still alive. At this moment, uh, there's husband, already dead because they kill men first. When they come in, they start killing men, especially the people who live in the city. Uh, I would say probably 75% plus die, got killed that moment because they consider you rich, you educated, you work for the government, you part of the uh, old regime. They want to wipe out those people first, especially you men. Uh, simple as uh, somebody wear eyeglass, they say you are smart. Intelligent, they kill you first for no reason. Uh, they didn't know that you can't see. But all the thing is, you are smart. Um, so uh, when they separate us, they take us away. Like uh, um, the men go, just say V and Pearl. The men go in uh, Meridian, Mississippi. Women go to Brookhaven. The boy will go to uh, South Haven, and the girl be somewhere in Mississippi. And we all, we don't know where, where each of us be at. But um, as a five, uh, I'm, I'm turning six, six turning seven at that moment. As a young boy, um, before they separate me from my mom, they, my mom said that, it doesn't matter where you at. I will be right here waiting for you. That was the last word I hear from my mom. That was the last word she told me. So from 75 to 79, we all work in the rice field from sunrise to sunset, seven days a week. At the end of the day, they give us a ripe bowl of soups, which is have about 10 grains of rice. They gave us a set of uniform, which is black, black pants, black sh button shirt, Everybody wear the same uh, uniform. Everybody have the same haircut. You know, woman like a right here about your neck, just straight up. Man, it's just one haircut. Uh, we we all look the same. And at this moment, we we they just work us every day for for nothing. Everything that we grow, everything that we reap, we belong to them. And. You know, here we can call in sick. <laughs> we can use vacation. Whatever you, you have, you, the day you're tired. But over there, uh, you might even call in death because they don't, they don't allow you. If, if you bless you, have physical strength to get up and go to work, you still have another to live. If you can't uh, crawl, whatever, they will kill you, intimidation. And while we working in the rice field, you know, carry dirt and making rice, farming, what they do is if someone didn't move fast enough, they say, go, 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 faster, faster, work harder. And it, it, only limitation on how our body can do it, and then that person will, will get killed or executed. And 
be blessed to that person who, who, who got killed by them if they just take you one shot and dead. And what they do, they cut, they, they cut your throat slowly with uh, this palm tree that like a chainsaw, slowly let you bleed and, and, and just show to people. They put you on the top of the hill where everybody can see and tell me, this is what's going to happen if you don't perform. And after that, you get cut your head off and stick on the stick and just put on the pole right there so you, you can see it throughout the day. And um, for the, the parent that uh, still have young kid with them, the, the fem mom, uh, they toss that kid in the air and let it drop. And you know, AK-47 used to have the knife on, on the, at the end of it, just poke it through and just shot in the air. And um, from 75 to 79, they kill p more than 2 million people. We all got executed, died, starvation, sickness, total over 2 million. So when, when they come in the city, they, they push people out. M my family tried to escape to Vietnam because that's the closest uh, border. Uh, by the time we get closer to the border, they took control of the country, so we can't escape. So we travel several days to the village that we in, and you know, I got a lot of younger siblings than me, crying, hungry for food, starving, don't don't have any food to eat for several days. So my dad, um, at night, he sneak out into the rice field, try to find whatever he can find, crab, fish, uh, whatever in the rice field, and then, um, they found out that he did that. They came the next day. They say, get out, get out of the house. And we were scared, we didn't, we didn't know, you know, because four or five of them come, and my dad come out, they, they just tie him up. And then uh, right there uh, in front of us, they beat him up so bad, torture him, and um, they execute him right in front of us. They say, that's what happened when you try to steal from, from us, that us, I mean, the government. So everything belonged to them. So my dad got executed because he tried to go find food to feed the kids and his family. So in, in that 79 to 75, everybody go through the same thing my family go through. My, my, my dad have seven brothers, they all got executed. My mom, I don't know how many she have, but the, from my dad and my mom's side, only my mom, me and my brother, still alive of all the family member that we have. Same thing my wife family, <clears throat> she got wiped out too. She only her and her mom uh, alive uh, during that span of the communist era. Wow. There was a powerful moment there that happened back in that field where you were separated from your mom. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that moment? She, um, th at that moment, you know, I, I went to, they took me away from, from her. Of course, she's, I, I don't know how my mom feel, but I couldn't imagine being a, a dad right now. Uh, your kid taking away from you, and and I got nine siblings. All of them die because starvation and sickness. So they take me to this uh, compound, like the room like this. They just tear out the wall, only the roof left. So we work every day from sunrise to sunset, come back, and whatever space you can find, that's where you're going to sleep at. And you know, at night it was so cold, Sometimes I, I cry for mom, where you at? I say, oh God, please help me, I'm so cold. There are many times I'm starving at night. There's so many times I'm thirsty, uh, dehydrated because they don't allow us to eat and drink on their watch only. And uh, I cry out, you know, the first instinct as a kid is you're looking for your mom first. <laughs> and I can tell that my kid now, when they're sick, they always go to mom first. And um, you know, I same time I say, "Oh God, please help me! I want to see my mom. I want to know where my mom at. Uh, where's the food? I'm hungry. Please help! Just cry out for 
that's the instinct that I have. So there was a way back to mom. Tell us a little bit about that. So in 1979, the Vietnamese invade our country. You know, war is bad. Doesn't matter what it is. Um, but for us, for the Cambodian people at that moment, it's a blessing to us. Now we say, okay, Vietnamese come in now. They're too busy in fighting each other with the Khmer So we start escape. Um, and me living on the border, we know right away immediately that, oh, there, there's the Vietnamese invading our country. Now, now it's time for us to run away from them or escape from where we are. So all I, I, I don't know where my mom at, but all I, I heard was the last time she said, doesn't matter what, I'll be right here waiting for you. So I, I, I escaped from that place where I live, take me over three days because of, um, we are, I can only do it at night uh, so people don't see, uh, uh, so I can get ch chance to people to kill me. So three days later, I went up to that place. There's my mom waiting under the tree. And the first thing I asked my mom was, where are my brothers? Only one left but her. And she say, they're all dead through starvation and sickness during that span. And soon, you know, she heard me, uh, we cry and mom just embraced me. And then she just hold, out, hold my hand and carry my younger brother. We start escaping from Cambodia. And doing, for, because of we way out in the Vietnamese Cambodian border, we have to walk across Cambodia to Thailand. It takes us over not, uh, 10 months to do that. And doing escape, we, we shot at, bomb drop, fragment, I can feel bullet like past my hair, beside my body, and next thing you know, oh God, please help me, protect me, please. And my mom, you know, she kind of shield me on her, the side of her and my brother uh, in front of her chest, just, uh, you know, find a tree trunk just, just to, to dodge the bullet and the bomb. And um, when we we when we went deep into the jungle and in that region only two seasons is dry and wet. By the time we reach to the jungle forest, deep forest is raining, raining all the time, day and night. At this moment we just don't know where we're going. Cause no daylight and the only thing we can do is uh, we can escape during the at night. At the same time we were scared of the being shot at, but that region of the world, the most infested landmine in the world at the moment. And, but we got to take that step, that f every step that we take is another chance to live. But if we stay, choose to stay, there's no chance to survive. And uh, we would get killed by the Khmer or the Vietnamese or starve to death there. So during escape, we, when we crossed a big body of water, you know, people, Wipe away, we caught the current. Just say 20 of us try to cross right now, probably two or three of us make it to the other side. Because at the moment we are so weak, our body, you know, we could, our kneecap is bigger than our head because we don't have food to eat, lack of nutrition, we're so skinny, all you see is ripping bone. At this moment too, we don't have, our clothes deteriorate already. There's no more clothes, so we use leave just to cover ourselves up. You ever watch the uh, Tribe in the movie Discovery Channel? That's how we are, and then walking barefoot uh, in a deep jungle for nine plus months. And during those escape, I can see so much our human heart, the will to survive, the love for each other. I can see it all. Uh, you know, the the mom that still have young kids is they ask, uh, you gotta leave your kid behind, or you stay with your kid. We cannot let you have the kid with you because young kid making noise, cry at night. The, so people here, the Camaro here, the Carrera here, shoot at us. So that's the decision mom have to do, uh, to leave your kid behind or to stay with your kid behind. And I see both worlds. Um, 
some mom, some family, leave their kid behind, leave their sickness behind so they can move on and go. And some, the, the one who stays just say, leave me here. You go. Take them so they have another chance to live. And um, so many of us have to sacrifice for one another. And, and, and you, I can see both love and sacrifice during my escape. And um, when we, we several time that we step on landmine, because we got to walk a straight line. You can't go offline. So the first 10, 15 men that lead us, they, 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 they're the one who take chance to live and die before us. So one time uh, uh, we step on, one of the first guys step on a landmine. So the first 10 people down the line immediately got killed because by the landmine. And um, my so-called stepdad now, he step, he also got hit just a little bit on his front toes. But for nine months in the jungle, the meat started tearing. We started cutting bone out raw. By the time we get to Thailand, he got this much left on his foot. So, just um, say about a thousand of us escaped that route with me. About a hundred, hundred fifty of us make it to the Thailand border. So there was hope in Thailand. All right. Uh, tell us about what did the environment look like? What was your family uh, blessed with, but at the same time still very much in need once you guys made it to Thailand? When we got to Thailand that night, we, we, because we only escaped at night, so we got to Thailand. We don't know what time it is, but at night, when we hit to Thailand, we see this electric city, right? Well, me, as a young boy, I don't know in the other field, but I react and say, there's a sun. There's another sun beside the real sun, you know, because it's so bright in that soccer field. And they, uh, the Thai people cook rice for us for, for that, e that night. And my goodness, that the best rice I ever put in my mouth. That was the, the best of the best. Still there is right now, we're thinking back. And then, uh, but at the same time, there's more people die right there at the soccer field. Because we eat so much, Ryan, and you pass out. So by the morning, uh, they take us, they transport us to to a camp, cow, uh, cow line camp. It's just like an uh, open field. Um, they, they take us there, and they gave us, um, you know, a little sheet of the blue thing, blue plastic thing when you, we have roof leak, they put on that. They gave us that to take it with us. Guy, first time that night when we get to that camp that I sleep without a raindrop on me. From 75 to 79. That was amazing how that little sheet of blue plastic thing mean to me. And, you know, we used to sleep. The sky was our roof. <laughs> the, wa the wind it was our wall. It was just, um, uh, just with that blue tent was, was amazing. And then when we get to that camp, it's still chaos, no organization yet, but there's a group of Thai government kind of uh, coordinate the, the how we supposed to live there. Uh, while, we, while we find a tent there, put a tent to, to live, you know, there's no food yet. So um, I went to um, where the Thai people stay at, where they take that dumpster. We don't have trash pickup like over here. You just dump it out in the field. So I went to that field. I just dig through it. I just just kick it with the stick water. And then I found a, a chicken head. One chicken head. I was so happy. I take it out. I clean it. Yes. I run home so fast. I never run that fast even when I escape. I, 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 didn't, I don't remember I run that fast. I run home and tell mom, Mom, look, I got chicken head. Mom start boiling that water, cut that chicken head in four pieces. Because now at this moment, my, my mom, uh, you know, my stepdad, we kind of, they get married already. So she cut that thing in four pieces. That was the best. The best chicken head you ever had. That that was that was amazing how how it it tastes. And then uh, we stay in camp from seventy five uh, from seventy nine to eighty five. 
Now my family grew to five people. Um, family of five, they give us one kilogram of rice, which is about two and a half pounds, one kilogram of protein, and 40 liter of water for one whole week. That's how we live uh, for, th for those years. And that, that water, you have to go. <laughs> Just say, this is where I live in camp. The water is uh, past my donut shop. We have to go carry it. By the time we get it to the house, some spills. I'm like, oh my goodness. About, you know, the, they, they got us a square box, square container, 40, 20, 20 on each side. I carry it. By the time we reach home, this much of water gone. And uh, I don't remember when the last time I take bath. Except rain water, when it rain comes, we just take our clothes off and run, take a shower out there. We call rain shower over here, right? I got the real one when in Cambodia. So uh, we, we live there, no, no, no school, no religion, no currency whatsoever, nothing. It's just like the dog year. God had a plan to get you to freedom where you would be provided for in a greater way. So why don't you tell us about what that rescue and the next step begin to be to get you to where you are today. So in that camp, you know, we, uh, people, a lot of refugees have opportunity to come to other countries like Canada, USA, Australia. If they have family, friend who know them, they sponsor them. For me, I don't have any, I don't know anybody. I don't have friend, have family or whatsoever in, in outside uh, Thailand. So we live there day to day, hopeless every morning, every day, wake up, say, what's next? We don't know what's next because we don't. It's a hope that one day we get a chance to come to America or something. And one day, um, you know, there's a place where they post the name in the middle of the camp. You have to walk so mile to get there from where, I, where, where my, my house and camp. They post a name. They have a list who have name for interview. So one day I went and I saw my, my stepdad name. I look at it, I say, spell right, everything right. I run home and ask him, see the our ID, it match everything. And we just was so happy, extremely happy. Then, uh, then we, we got an interview. USCC sponsored my family. United Catholic Cherry sponsored my family. So we went through the interview process with INS. The question they asked is if... if they can ask you any kind of question, but long your answer not relate to the communists, most likely you pass the, the process and come to whatever country sponsor you. So my, my staff, I just, uh, he just tell them straight up, he say, well, for, from 75, 79, you in it or you not in it, you gotta be a part of them. Otherwise, we wouldn't be alive today. So with that honest question, they pass us, uh, we, have uh, every paperwork to come to America. And uh, the INS guy, the American guy asked, uh, where do you want to live? Where, where, where do you want to live? My dad said, USA, USA, America. And uh, they tried to say that, what, where, where, where? Is My dad just said, USA. So um, he pulled out a map of America, put on the table, where do you want to live? My dad, uh, kinda, uh, kinda, you know, intimidated by him, so he just point. So he look and point, put his finger in the middle. It had to be Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> so that's where they drop us off. We did not know that America have 50 states, you know, <laughs> and uh, we didn't know California have a lot of Asian there, or you know, we could have, we could have went there. <laughs> <laughs> but Memphis, Tennessee, when they drop us off. Um, you know, there's Cam Cambodian people come uh, greet us, and at that time, people still can go into the airport to the terminal, kind of greet us. We first time we saw Cambodian, and then when they take us to the apartment, when they go over the bridge, it was whoa. Uh, we never see anything like that. I say, wow, what is this? You know, and uh, it's just amazing, like heaven on earth to 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 me. And uh, they put us in an apartment, uh, one-bedroom one apartment in Bing Binghampton, 
uh, Memphis, Tennessee, that the uh, number one worst crime in the United States back in the day. <laughs> you, you heard about it between Chicago and Memphis, Bingham. Then we have uh, some kind of massacre down there back in the day. But um, it, it was better than any. There was heaven on earth for us. Okay. But uh, when I was, uh, before I come to America, they transfer us to a camp. They call six-month camp. They teach us the culture of America, how to live, uh, ba basically living like use knife, forks, napkin, toilet. So uh, when they start and show how to use knife and fork, we will make fun among each other. Say, man, if we have knife back in the day, we would have killed each other for that rice, so uh, rice bowl of soup, you know, <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, they teach us all these things. But the funny thing it was, uh, I didn't share with the first. When we fly out from Cambodia, you know, uh, in a plane, there's a waitress come down the aisle. Say, you want something to drink? You want something to eat? Like that? And I have no clue what she say. I do raise your hand, and she say, um, something to drink? I say, yeah, yeah. So she hand me a seven up. She pop it already, so she hand to me. I take that thing like I drink water. It's almost choked me to death. <laughs> I, I, I did not know that they have so many, so much hibernate car water. <laughs> and when they teach us how to use the toilet back in the camp, you know, we got the toilet at the one that we use at home. You know, you know where to flush and all of that. In the airplane. I, when I need to go to the bathroom, at first I don't know where we can communicate. When I get in there, I, I, I ask her, I don't know, try to speak. I say, I don't know what I do here, you know. And I want her to go in with me, and she said, no, no. <laughs> so, you know, to push the button, my good, when, when that, when I flush the thing, it's so strong, so whoo! I almost bust out that door. I tried to run out that door, but I couldn't. <laughs> but um, you know, it's quite a journey that um, that um, I, that's how I get to come to America. So God obviously had a plan to rescue you physically, to rescue your family, but He was also rescuing you spiritually, and He had a plan for your soul. Talk about man, what did God begin to do there in Memphis, Tennessee, to lead you to the place of knowing Jesus? So. Um, in, in Memphis, Tennessee, we, we, I came here as a refugee. So we have Vietnamese, Cambodian, Laos, um, but uh, they have a group of uh, church in, in the area. Highland High Baptist Church focused on helping Cambodian refugees. So I live in an apartment by the third week. You know, we don't know anybody still, but that apartment conflict is... All Cambodian except one American guy lived downstairs. Mine, he kind of take care of it. And uh, by the third week or so, I start seeing kid uh, get on the bus every Sunday. Um, then I I ask him well, where they going, what are, what they doing. They say, oh, the Highland Baptist Church. Uh, that's where Cambodian go and men go and all that. So I I just want to be see mingle with a Cambodian kid, you know, have some friends or get to know them, whatever. So I start going to, to Highland Baptist Church. But um, when I start going there, we have a um, congregation, like a small room like this that they carved for us to, for American preacher preach and Cambodian guy translate. So our service went double, guys. So don't think about uh, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock here long. We went three to six hours because we have, the guy had to translate. So, but there's 10 couples, American couples. They're there every Sunday, and they don't know what we're talking about. If we don't understand them, they don't understand us. But they're there for us every Sunday. On top of that, they help us, uh, all the Cambodian refugees, find jobs, get food stamp, get places, uh, travel. We don't, ha we don't know how to ride a bus. They teach us what the bus route. So it's everything. They get the vehicle for, for us. They go upstairs, two, three-story building. Uh, doesn't matter what day or night. They take us to the hospital. They take us to the doctor. They help us get whatever all our basic need. 
And this guy uh, in the late 60s, early 70s already, and uh, the Stephen DeMeyer, that the one I get real close to them, and I, I follow the Stephen, he, him and his wife got a, this mini van, Ford mini van that always can carry more, so I go help, kind of help them take the food to the Cambodian people. So I start doing that, and then uh, we kind of communicate with each other best we can to, uh, to understand each other. And then I start and notice, uh, I say, man, this 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 1, 2, at night, and this neighborhood, they shouldn't be there because they're white anyway. So, you know, so um, I, I just say, I say, I want to love my people like they love my people. What is that, that they love us so much? They don't care about their safety. They don't care about they old already. They can't climb the stair like they used to. But I say, I want to, I want, I want to, I want to have the love that they have. So I start, and at this moment, you know, I, I come to the state turning 17. I've never been in school in my life because in, in back home, there's no country, no school, no religion, no whatsoever. Everything like year zero for them. So I never been in school in my life. So I I I was placed in ninth grade in high school, ESL class. They put A B C on the board for forty five minute class. Guess how many letter I got on my sheet? D. And I said, man, I wish I can take that white sheet of paper and go on the board and trace it. That way it helped me get to Z. But you know, I, I learned a little bit talking to, um, learn how to read, and then I couldn't read, but I don't understand, like say, I love you, I can read, I love you, but I don't know what that means. So um, by the time I understand a little bit, so I got Cambodian Bible now, so I can read Cambodian. But John 3.16 was my favorite verse, it was the first verse that I know, that God so loved the world. And I say, and then I start seeking to the truth of it. What God loved the world. The world is existing, you know, Asian, American, everything. And and then back, I heard about Christ before, and I thought Jesus is only God to the white folk only, you know, not for the Asian. So when I I learned that verse, and I start see the living proof that He lived through those ten couple, that's when I say, this is it for me. I accept Christ in 1985 as my Lord and Savior because of those 10 couples that love us relentlessly, and I can feel Jesus' love through them. Yep. <laughs> the unconditional pursuing love of God, that God rescued you and he used his people to demonstrate that tangible love. Uh, and Frank, it kind of speak on behalf of our family, just to say, like, it's it's impossible for us to to wrap our minds around the journey that you were on. Um, as you sit here today, looking back on that 15 to 17 year journey and s a segment of your life, I mean, what do you, what do you take from that? As you think about the character of God, His love, His grace, even when you didn't even know that He existed, what did God teach you? How has that shaped your faith today? Well, um, looking back, he he loved me when I was a sinner. He knew me when I don't even know him, uh, when I never heard of him before. So um, when I cry out for help at night, when I'm so cold, I look I for mom, oh God, help me. He hurt me. When I starve to death, when I thirst to death, he hurt me. So looking back, now not not only... He hurt me. He blessed me. Now I don't, I don't have the blue shed anymore. He gave me a mansion instead of how he gave me a mansion. He gave me a family that I lost. Now my family grew from from three to five, from five to three kids, and you know multiple uh, grandkids for my pa my mom, and um, he gave me. Food. He put me exactly where what I want, you know, that 
And that cam, when I that first bite of that chicken head was so awesome. And 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 I forgot to tell you that uh, when that six month cam, they play this Chinese movie. They the guy kill a bird and he take a bite, uh, take a piece of Thai meat and put it in his mouth like this. At 17 year old boy, my water, my my water start dripping. And then I say, Oh God, I don't know him yet. I just say, Oh God, if I have just have a pure meat in my mouth, no rice, no veggie. If I have to die tomorrow, I'd be happy. He hurt me then. He not only blessed me from starving, not starving, not hungry. He put me the place where I work with food every day. <laughs> now is the choice, not not where the food comes from. It's choice what I'm going to eat today. And that's part of Frank's calling to own a restaurant and to be in the food business is uh, because he was without. And he says, now I don't want anybody to be without. Um, you know, church, as, as I heard Frank's story, man, I went, man, our, our family needs to hear that. And, you know, it was a story of impossible rescue. I mean, literally none of us can grasp what it looked like to be in the heart of Cambodia, in the camp in Thailand, to be rescued, to be that without. But God rescued you. And it was an impossible physical rescue, but God also rescued his soul. But, you know, as I thought about Frank's story from the first time I heard it, I went, you know what, in so many ways, though, that is a picture of the gospel. That's a picture of the gospel, that while we were still far away, as Paul says in Romans, while we were still sinners, while we were still powerless, we didn't come to him, but he came and he rescued us that he pursued us, that all of us are in need of a rescue. Maybe not physically like Frank was, but all of us are in need of a rescue. And church, here's what I would say to you today, is that no matter where you are, and I imagine for Frank, God, when he didn't even know him, and then even when he began to know God, he still felt maybe far away. For some of you today, you, you may feel that God's far away, maybe because of decisions that you've made or choices that you've taken or things that have happened to you. And today, would you hear through Frank's story that there's a God of unconditional pursuing love who comes after you, he chases you, he wants you to know him just like Frank's come to know him? I think perhaps the most beautiful part of Frank's story is one that Jesus has rescued him, but, you know, forgiven, rescued people, or as we say in this house, those who get life, they have a call to give life back. And Frank has now accepted been just a really amazing purpose and calling from God in this new season of life as he's at a new place. And so, Frank, I want you to tell him for uh, just a moment today, and what, what is that new calling that God's put on you, and how's he using you? Well, since I become a Christian in 1985, you know, I've been, I've been praying that one day that I can face the people who killed my father and my family. Not to yell at him, not to scold him, not to hurt him, not to yank his neck, you know, shake him off, or not to ask why you killed my father and my family, but simply to let them know about Jesus Christ and how much he loved them. And I've been praying for so many years, and finally I got a chance, the moment to go out and face them, because uh, Rob, he's my pastor at Broadmoor, he challenged us one day, say, take one day or one week out of your life this coming year to impact and make a difference in people's life. So that challenge, uh, we come home and pray for it, what it would be. So where I come from, uh, like a water. So water would first come into my head. My head say, okay, we we, we want to go back home and uh, dig some well, water well for the for the, those who don't have access to it. Right now, still eighty plus percent of people in our country don't have access to clean water. And and that water was well would come to mind, and then I say, let. Let, because the bitterness that I have, you know, anger, rage, mad. Why these people kill my father, my family? I say, well, I want to go to Waterwell, where those people live. 
are still exist. And when we come to the conclusion, we contact people in Cambodia, they say, no, you can't do that, too dangerous. Uh, I'm not allowed you to go do that. And I say, well, I feel, I feel God that he want me to forgive these people. He want me to go out and tell how much Jesus loved them. So I take that chance. I say, I've got to do it. So me and my wife went and dig water well in the, the remote village where the Khmer is. Soon we walk in. <laughs> There's a guy without clothes. I'm talking not, not literally without, no shirt, no pants, just a little uh, scarf, uh, you know, put around his waist because they poor. And a bunch of AK-47 holding, like, first thing he asked was, why you do what you do over here? You know anybody here? Because they already know we the one who dig the water well for them. And uh, my first response is saying, no, um, um, I mean, uh, I respect him uh, older. He older than my father, that I call him. And I say, no, um, I don't have, a, I don't know anybody here. Um, then he say, why you do this? I told him, say, well, God love you. And God calling, urging me and my wife to come do water well for you guys. And then he, he kind of, I feel like he, ins I'm insulting him or whatever. I don't know what he feel, but all I know, he slammed his gun to the ground. <laughs> and then when I got goosebumps, I say, oh my goodness, what do we get into? But after he gave me opportunity to say, you know, ask that question, I say, you know, Jesus loved you. Jesus loved me. And he calling me to come do this. And then he start. Then after that, I have no fear. I just talk to them just like I'm talking to you right now. And then, you know, we, we do ceremony. I gave $500 for the people who cook food to feed the village. $500 feed the whole village. So um, well, then uh, we got a picture kind of in the region start talking about gospel living. Next thing you know, we ask to raise the hand who who accept Jesus, who who feel his love here. There are more than 40 of them raised their hand to accept Jesus Christ. This is the Camaro to kill more than 2 million people. You know, I go do that because I've been praying that um, my heart always aching, broken for those who don't know Christ. And not because I don't believe in justice being so just because they need to know Jesus Christ. That's why we want to do that. And and the funny thing, we baptize them in a bucket of water. <laughs> With the water well coming out, we just soak the head in there. And the pastor baptize them in that bucket. Like, like a, a duck stick the head in the bucket. <laughs> and how amazing that a man who's been rescued would follow God's calling to go and give physical water. And through that, God would begin to pour out living water into the lives of people who'd never known him. Frank, you've blessed us today. And, uh, you know, we're a family who says we get life in Jesus. And we've all been far away. We've all needed to be rescued. But then we're called to give life back. And so Frank's partnered with an organization. And so today, uh, man, because of what I believe that God's calling us to be as a spiritual family here in this city. I believe God calling us to, to give life. And so today, just on behalf of the exchange, Frank, I've shared this with him. We're giving five water wells to the heart of Cambodia. Yep. And our prayers, just like Frank's, that man is physical, clean water, all right, that we take for granted. We'll be blessed to these people. We pray that God would do a living water work and that he would pour out his spirit into the hearts of people who may have never heard of him before. Never heard of him before. Frank, thank you for blessing us today. You know, church, I believe there's maybe one of two places where you kind of land at the end of today. And we prayed for you. As Frank was going to share his story today, I think for some of you, um, Maybe you realize that you were far from God, and maybe today you realize your story needs to be rescued. 
The same God who rescued Frank is the same God who loves you. The same God who would rescue you. May we would love to help you, to pray with you, to encourage you in your faith journey. So at the end of our gathering today, may you grab somebody from our ministry team or you can use a connection card that's underneath your seat. Or if you're online today, you can see how you can respond there just by simply texting your name. Some of you, your story needs to be rescued just like God loved Frank and physically rescued him. You need to be spiritually rescued. But I think there's also a call that for those of us who are in Christ, man, there's a call to to give life and to share it. So you've heard about what we're doing today as a spiritual family. Maybe God leads you today to do something individually or as a couple, as a household. So Frank's partnered with an organization called AquaShare, where they take clean water to the heart of Cambodia. So you're seeing information there on the screen about how you as your personal family could just check that out. See if there's something that God would lead you to do to be a part of blessing the people of Cambodia uh, with clean water that may lead to living water. Church family, could you, uh, you help me tell Frank thank you today for his time and what God's doing through his story? Thank you. I just want to, I don't know how to share and express in words how God blessed me in my life and my family. I might be not the richest man on this planet earth, but I'm the richest man alive today. And the, the question is, uh, how do I can tell the believers to, to come to know Christ or the one who heard about Christ come to know Christ? God? is you put him first in everything you do seek him first in all your circumstances he's going to be in it with you and with it all with you and you know we don't have to have million dollars as long we have each other you have enough wealth enough health enough happiness enough joys but when you have Jesus Christ you will live forever in heaven together. Church, I hope today that you've been blessed, that you've been challenged, you've had your mind increased, your faith strengthened today uh, through the way that God's used Frank. And today I want you to stand with me as we get ready to walk out. And uh, man, we're going to declare what we believe, who we are as a house. As Frank and I sit here, would you then declare together uh, just our declaration as we exit today? You'll see it on the screen and you can follow along with me. Here's what it says. Let's declare it together, church. We believe that the great exchange took place when Jesus, who had no sin, became sin for us so that we could know God. We exist to see people exchange their old life for new life in Christ and live out their purpose. Christ's love compels us to exchange ideas for truth. God's word is our standard. Selfishness for serving. We will serve others, pleasing for reaching. We will share our faith, keeping for dispersing. We will make disciples, forgetting for celebrating. We will praise God. We are the church. Church, you are dismissed. Thanks for being a part of the gathering. We believe you were meant to hear and experience the truth of God's word in your life today. And we pray you feel challenged and encouraged towards next steps in your faith. If you feel like God spoke to you through today's gathering and you'd like to talk to someone, or you just love the opportunity for someone to pray with you, we'd love to serve you in that way. No matter where you are and when you're watching, you can reach out to a member of our ministry team by simply texting your name to 601-397-6111. Our team would love to help you and encourage you as you seek to know and follow God with your life. God bless, and until we gather again, let's go and be the church.